don't need fortune or fame when I'm lost in your presence I find everything I don't need kingdoms or splendor not a voice for a crowd just to be with you Jesus is all that I so with hands lifted high, I surrender all my life. Every piece, every part, come and resurrect this heart. Every voice, better is a day in your presence. Sweeter is a moment with your place than a thousand any other place than a thousand any other place better is a day with you just to sit just to sit at your table Swept away by your love Every burden is lifted Every boy feel we trust So I won't move till you move me I just can't get enough Sing it You're the fire inside me You are the breath in my lungs Better is a day In your presence Sweet
week, all of this week, all of even today, I just kind of, I just want you to sit in this moment. Father, you have our full attention. You know, church, all week I've been led to kind of have this moment right here where if you've been watching the news or social media or whatever, you, you saw the earthquake that hit the Turkey and Syria area. And I think that the count now is 28,000 lives that have been lost and other injuries. And, but as the church and as believers, a lot of us, full of faith, full of hope, carriers of peace, I wanna pause the service and just believe for them and pray for them. And I told the last service, sometimes I feel like we need to stand in the gap because there's probably a lot of people that live there that wish that they could be here today raising their hands and worshiping in freedom. 
but if we can just do it in their place, maybe. So during this prayer, I just want you to lift up this, the church over there. Because me and Shannon were talking about it just after the last service. I feel like when, when, tra- when there's just terrible things that happen, people, the soil of their heart is just so tangible and so ready. And if you've been at rock bottom a lot like I have, that's when I experienced the Lord too. Because when I had nothing left, I felt like. So I want to lead us in a time of prayer. And if you can just all across the room, just raise your hands. Maybe even representing somebody that wish they could lift their hands today. Father, we stand in your presence. God, we ask for wholeness. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit just move through that area, God. This is what I love about your character is that you lack nothing. So whatever those families need, God, whether they need peace or freedom or hope, God, you fill in our gaps. And I'm so thankful for that. Holy Spirit, I ask for peace over every person that has been affected, every family member. As the Bible says, the peace that passes all understanding. Some of us in in this room have experienced that peace. And I pray over those families that your Holy Spirit would cover. God, for the church over there, God, I pray that it's strengthened. I pray for fresh fire and fresh wind over those churches, that they're able to receive and give what only you can give, Father. Your ways are so much higher than ours, and God, right now, we just partner with you, our advocate. We ask for wholeness, we ask for healing, we ask for hope. Cover that land with your joy, every fruit of your spirit, Father. And God, I ask for revival. There's a confession of need. They need you, Father. So I pray that your revival would come through like only you can do, God. You'll hear from heaven our cries, our prayers, our concerns, and you'll look down and you'll heal your land. That is our prayer, Father. We put it in your hands, the only hands that we can trust. It's in your mighty name we pray.
church, don't allow your mind to shift from this place right here because I believe for every one of us that's open and that's willing, I think God wants to meet us right here in this place and do something amazing in each one of us. And let me tell you what I think that is. You know, we're singing about the song revival and this idea of, of, of breathing life back into a dead thing or an awakening, waking up something that's been asleep. And you know, the Bible is full, if you read just a little bit, you'll read he's full of suddenlies, these suddenly moments. And if you're City Hope family, you know in just a minute, we're gonna finish this, you're gonna sit down, we're gonna give some announcements and we're gonna have a message. But what God does, he shows up in the, even when we're looking to the next five minutes, he shows up suddenly and does something that alters our life forever. And I think this could be that. I don't think it has to be at the end of this an incredible message with an altar call. Like I think it can be right here. And let me tell you what I think it is. I think there's things, and I, this is like a big statement. I think there's things in every single one of us that we've allowed to go to sleep. Whether it was a calling, whether it was a passion, whether it was a yes one time 20 years ago and then somehow through the years it just got foggy and it's a maybe and then it's a nah, not anymore. Maybe it's some boldness. Maybe it's just some courage that God's speaking and one day it was, it was there and it was white hot and it was on fire and it was alive and we celebrated it. But over the last few months, years, it's asleep. You wanna see God sweep a nation? He's first gonna sweep you, he's gonna sweep me, he's gonna come across, he's gonna breathe. So what I would love to ask you to do, if you're just, and you don't, we don't even know what this is, it's been asleep so long. But if you wanna just let God show you, just open your hands up. Now I'm gonna stop talking for about 10 seconds. And I believe God's gonna point this, and he's not condemning you, it's okay, he's just saying, that's the thing I wanna breathe life back into. And we're just gonna take 10 seconds and let him identify that. God, show us. Now for many of us in that room, in this room, we see it. He's just shown it to us. Now I want you to, with your words with me, just start surrendering that to him. God. I give that thing to you, Father. That thing has been asleep. That thing has is, is died. That thing is whatever it looks like it is. But God, I give you permission now in this moment, not five minutes from now, in this moment, God, I'm asking you to breathe life back into this thing. God, where I once had passion and I don't have any more, God, I give it back to you. I want passion there. God, that calling that I've just pushed to the side. God, where I used to say yes, and now I say maybe or maybe not. No, today it's a yes. Just surrender it. Say, God, it's yours. Say that loud. Say it one more time. God, it's yours. Now I want you to change that posture. I want you to lift your hands over your head if you're comfortable. And I want you to take another 10 seconds and just thank him. God, thank you for not letting that thing die and stay dead. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for awakening that thing, God. Thank you for breathing new life. God, thank you for, for tomorrow holds as I lean into this thing and what you wanna do through this calling, through this passion, through this yes, through this boldness. God, we trust you. Now what I want you to do, church, for 10 seconds, celebrate with everything you got because what he just woke, nobody could do that for you. Come on. A revival in the world is not a building on fire. It's you on fire. It's me on fire. It's us awakened to the things of God so that we can carry out his plans and his purposes. Amen. You excited to be here? Turn to one or two people and say, hey, you are a, a revived. You are awakened. And you can have a seat. Some of you will walk out of this place different than the way you came in and that's exciting so glad that you're here church man my name is Dale and I'm your campus pastor really glad that you're here hey listen I know we've got people in the room for the first time ever so do me a favor City Hope family just get it loud one more time for them let's welcome them 
And if that is you, there's a card beside you, in front of you, it's a connect card. You can fill it out, drop it off at one of the banners out front. It's a new here banner. Uh, and, and there'll be people there, we'll give you a gift and we'll thank you for being here. But listen, today is a big, big, big day. Uh, we have our 2023 Kingdom Builder Project guides in hand. We're gonna be able to hand those out to you. I really thought y'all would applaud right there, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, last year y'all gave like $1.25 million toward this thing. I thought you'd be like, woo, let's do it again. Uh, we've raised, and if you were here last week, you heard it. If you weren't, well, I get to tell you, like we raised our goal this year. Instead of $1 million, it's 1.25. We're just like, we think God can do that again. So you're gonna get your book on your way out. I do want you to do this. Listen, you can start giving toward that immediately. Uh, but on March the 12th, we're gonna have that annual kickoff offering so we can maybe fund a couple projects, get the thing going. Uh, this is a fun fact about the three weeks into January, I realized I was, I was, we were doing a Kingdom Builder financial review, kind of making plans for, to start Kingdom Builders. So we're, this was January, we hadn't even started Kingdom Builders yet and like over $25,000 had been given to Kingdom Builders in January and we hadn't even started it yet. So you guys have, are about the kingdom, I love it, it's great. We are doing something today though we've never done before, which is cool. Uh, we've actually got some of our Kingdom Builder ministry partners that are here. They're actually right over in this little section right here. Y'all give them a round of applause. And they've got ministries local, they've got ministries in other countries and thank you for saying yes to what God called you to and just sticking with it and through the hard times and the good times and the bad times and just sticking with it. But they're not just gonna be here, they're gonna be in the lobby in the square after the service. So if you wanna stop by and meet them and uh, just ask them, say, what's God doing where you are? Where are you, what's going on? Like find out some of that stuff. One last thing I wanna tell you about in two weeks, we're gonna have a, uh, our first of this year, our baptism celebration. And we've got a number of people that have signed up. And what we're doing is we're just celebrating life change. We're celebrating people taking next steps in this discipleship journey. And if you've surrendered your life to Jesus and you haven't taken that step, I wanna invite you uh, to be a part of that. And we'll celebrate that with you. And uh, you can sign up for a class that we have. We started this last year and it just makes baptism so much more meaningful. But uh, you can sign up at cityhope.cc slash baptism or stop by out in the lobby. We've got a booth set up and a little banner. But what you'll do is you'll sign up, you or your child, and if you're ready to take that step, we'll just spend about an hour with you and talk to you about what does baptism mean and show you in the Bible where Jesus was baptized and what this can mean for you. It's not the end of the road. It's just another step on this incredible journey that we're learning about, uh, which is a great segue into this series, in this series that we're in. And so we're gonna go ahead and jump into this series, part two of the way of a disciple, but really are glad that you're your church. All right, what's up, everybody? I'm so glad that you're excited to be here because you're excited to be here, right? Yeah. Everybody? All right, well, listen, Malvis, help me out. Help me welcome the rest of our church family. Come on, put your hands together one more time. Mobile, Foley, everybody watching online. Uh, correctional facility campuses, it's great having everybody with us this weekend. We are in part two of the way of a disciple. So here's where, where we were last week. I need to do like a full recap, but I don't have time to do a full recap. So I hope that you watched last weekend or got to hear it and kind of see where we are. Um, but the quickest possible way for me to do it would be to just kind of say, what we did is we looked at the difference between culturally what we call Christian 
which is kind of this bare minimum of this American version, this modern version of, of cultural Christianity where I can, I can say a prayer, I can believe a few kind of minimal things about the gospel. Um, I can show up to church every now and then and that makes me a Christian. That makes me, you know, I don't have to go to hell anymore and I'm good. And how different that is from what we see when Jesus calls a disciple. Like there's this massive divide, this massive gap. As a matter of fact, we've created a category that Jesus never intended us to have. Like this idea of being saved, being a Christian, and that's it. When really what Jesus is calling us into is discipleship, to be a disciple. Now, I'm not, we're not throwing the word Christian out. We're not doing that at all. What we're trying to do is we're trying to understand the difference. We're trying to understand what it is that Jesus was actually doing. Okay, that's what we're after. We're not after the, the, the cultural version, the Americanized version. No, no, we're after what did Jesus actually do? Okay, that's what this is about. So this series is so important for who we are as a church and ultimately where we're going. So I wanna encourage you to lean in. I wanna encourage you to be here as much as often as you can throughout the series, because I'm telling you, we are laying some foundation for where God is taking us. Um, and I think it's important. The other thing to say on the front end is, um, is just that I'm asking personally, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to challenge every one of us. Okay, because what has to happen in this conversation, in this series, is there has to be a paradigm shift. Like we have to change the way we think. We have to change the way we see this, being a disciple and what it means. So that's what I'm asking the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm, I'm wanting you to ask the Holy Spirit is what does it mean to be a disciple? So let me start with this today. I want you to meditate on this today, tomorrow, this week. Maybe you have since last week. Maybe this has been, you know, those of you that are really leaned in and you're excited, maybe this has kind of been rallying around in your mind a little bit. But the question to kind of think on is this, is what is the Jesus way? I mean, if that's what we're talking about, that it's, not, that it's so much more than just the words of Jesus, it's actually the way of Jesus. Like what, what actually is that? That's what we're really wrestling. That's really what we're trying to get at. In John 14, Jesus himself said this, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus claims exclusively he is the way. He is the life. He is everything. Like it's only through him that we get to eternal life, but that we also get to abundant life, both on this earth and to come, right? Heaven to come. Like he's saying he is the absolute only way. As a matter of fact, in the early disciples, the earliest description of the disciples was followers of the way. Because it was all about the way, the way of Jesus. What in the world is this? You know, we live in a world that's like, we're so DIY. There's, I mean, you can literally go to YouTube and you can search anything, the way to do something, and you can find it. Right? That wasn't the case years ago, but now we can, we can literally search and find the way to do something, or you can download an app and find the way to a place right? through a GPS app. Right? So what does this mean? What is this idea of the way of Jesus, the Jesus way? What is this? What does this mean? I mean, we live in a world, it doesn't take a whole lot to look around and realize just how good we are as human beings at creating new ways to live life. Right? I mean, to the point that we're not even surprised anymore at the new ways that people come up with to live their life. Right? What does this mean? What does this way of Jesus mean? Well, Jesus himself, he, he characterized or, or categorized two ways. That's it, two ways. All the different ways that you can imagine that you see in our culture, that you see in our world, all the different things, Jesus really boiled it down to two different ways. And he said this in Matthew 7. This is the two ways. In the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. So what Jesus says is he's, he's, he's telling us about the way of life. And he says, there's two options, that's it. Even though it may seem like there are endless options, we live in a world where you, you can be anything, you can do anything, just whatever feels good, whatever it is, no, no. Jesus says, no, 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 there's only two options here. There's a wide way and there is a narrow way. Another way of saying it, and actually it's the other way that Jesus says it right here, is he said, there's an easy way 
and there's a hard way. Have you ever noticed that before? We, we, we kind of think of this verse as just wide and narrow, but Jesus actually says easy, hard. Why is the wide way considered the easy way? Why? Because it doesn't take any effort for you to go the wide way. It comes natural to us to go that way. That's why it's easy. It's the way that feels right to me. It's the way that, it's the way that I wanna go. It's the way that everybody else is going. The gate is wide, the path is wide. It's easy because it's natural to us to go that way. And a proverb, proverb 14 says this, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. What Jesus is saying is the wide way, the easy way is the way that seems right to me. It's the way that feels right, that feels good, that it's the way everybody else is going. And this is the easy way. This is the wide way. But Jesus doesn't leave it that way. He said, he did say that it's hopeless. It's gonna end up in destruction and death and that's it, pal, that's it. You got one way and it's the wide way. No, he says, no, no, listen, there actually is a way to life, eternal and abundant. There actually is a way to life, but it's narrow and it's hard. It's difficult. It's countercultural. It's subversive. It's the opposite to the way we naturally go because it doesn't come by natural means. It comes by supernatural means. It comes by the spirit of God infusing us and helping us and, and, and ultimately helping us get to that narrow way, that hard way to live. It's hard because it means that we have to acknowledge that our way is broken. Our default setting of kind of going the wide way, it's easy and it feels good to me, is broken. We have to, we have to be humble enough to, 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 to kill that, to crucify that. Jesus says this in Mark 8, he says, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said this. Let me, let me kind of tie back to last week. If you remember, we talked about invitation and challenge, that the way of Jesus is all invitation, man. It's, his arms are wide open. Hey, everybody come, everybody come, but then there's always gonna be a challenge. It's not just come and sit and be and kumbaya. No, no, there's a challenge that always comes with what Jesus brings. And this is what we're seeing right here. He's calling the crowd to join his disciples. Okay, so the crowds are following him. Thousands of people, I wanna be healed. I wanna be, the demons cast out. I want this, I want that. I want that from you, Jesus, give me something. And Jesus does all of that, it's amazing. But then what it says right here in Mark 8, is he actually is calling them, hey, move from the crowd to actually becoming a disciple because that looks really different. Big invitation, hey, everybody come. And then he hits them with a challenge. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You've got to take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, your way, um, uh, sorry, but if, if you, uh, sorry, Justin, I messed you all up. Now I can just call him by name because you've all met him. Um, <laughs> Go ahead to, to verse 36, Justin. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? You see, we all have a way that we live our life. I mean, it's our priorities, it's our values, it's the way we see the world, it's how we measure success, it's our purpose, it's our destiny, it's our goals. It's, I mean, it's all of those things, it's our character, all of those things are our way. And what Jesus is saying right here is he's saying, listen, you can go after all of those things and you may even get them, but they will be like sand in your fist that the, the tighter you squeeze those things that mean so much to you, the quicker they will fall out of your hands because you can't hang on to them. Your way, you may even be successful and you may even get everything that your heart so desires, but it's just like that sand. It's not gonna last, right? You can't take it to the grave. It's not gonna go beyond that. It, ultimately, it is not gonna lead you to life abundant and eternal. There's a Jesus way that does not seem right to you. There's a way of Jesus that doesn't come natural. It doesn't, just, it doesn't just happen naturally. No, no, it feels different. It feels difficult. It feels hard. Here's the problem with American Christianity is this, is that we have tried to combine the easy way and the hard way. 
We've said, I'm gonna say yes to Jesus. I'm gonna pray a prayer to get me out of hell, but then I'm gonna live my way. I'm gonna live, I'm gonna give my life to Jesus and then I'm gonna follow him however I wanna follow him. And Jesus says, that's not the way to life. That's easy. That's gonna come natural to you. That's the way your heart wants. That's what you desire. That's just what's easy to you. You say yes to Jesus and just keep doing whatever you wanna do. What does that do? That's not leading to what Jesus is wanting to call us to and lead us to. The narrow way is the hard way. It's the difficult way. This is what he's called us to. We've defined disciple this way. A disciple is someone who finds, follows, and becomes like Jesus. You don't become like Jesus following Jesus your way. You don't become like him unless you live like him, unless you follow his way. If you follow your way, guess who you become like? You. And that's not what we want. What we want is Jesus. More and more and more of Jesus in your life. His character traits, his compassion, his love, his competencies, his abilities. That's what we're after. Right, The whole reason we came to Christ in the first place was for that, not just so we can feel good and everything's gonna be all right. And I was praying a little prayer. No, no, I'm giving my life to him because I wanna become something different. I wanna become like him. So I'm taking way too much time on the introduction. I'm gonna jump into this thing. Um, But here's the thing. What I wanna do is this. I wanna look at kind of the way Jesus disciples his disciples. Okay, discipleship according to Jesus. And we're gonna do this in Mark 3. We're gonna look at one passage that kind of helps us understand in a very simple way, the way Jesus disciples, what it means to follow him in his way. Mark 3, a little setup would be this, is that just before this, Jesus is with the crowds. Again, they're pressing in, he's healing them, he's preaching to them. And then this happens in Mark 3, 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed and it goes on to list the 12. Okay, go back to verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those that he wanted. He called them to him. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you have been called. Called is not some special category up somewhere else. No, if you're a disciple of Jesus and you've said yes to Jesus, you've been called by him and you've been called by him into relationship. So point one and what discipleship to Jesus looks like is this, discipleship according to Jesus is relationship. And this is only point one. I said, well, there's three. This is only point one. Discipleship to Jesus is relationship. What he did was he called them into relationship. Think of Mark one, um, Matthew, one, or Matthew five, when Jesus is literally calling his disciples, he's walking along the Sea of Galilee and he sees a fisherman in a boat. He sees a fisherman on the shore and he says, come follow me. Right? What, what, what does he do? He is choosing them. He is calling them to come be in a relationship. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, hey, I'm calling you out of that booth and I'm telling you to come follow me. What Jesus is doing is he's calling them into relationship first. Again, this is different than any other rabbi in this, in this time period ever. Rabbis, philosophers, we taught last week, they all had disciples. Discipleship wasn't a new concept at all. They all knew what it meant to follow a rabbi. The difference was in that culture, a student would seek out a rabbi. They would put, it, put in an application just like you would for a university, right? I'm gonna send in my essay, my application, my transcripts, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna get accepted into this school, but not Jesus, These boys, they didn't put in any kind of application. There was no credentials. There was nothing. He just said, you, come follow me. Why? Because what he was doing was saying, I want you to come be with me. We saw in verse 14, I want you to come be with me. He appointed them. He called them into relationship with him. The first and most important thing we have to understand about discipleship is that it's all in relationship with Jesus. 
In John 15, just before going to the cross, he's sitting with his disciples and he says this, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I am, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This word abide also means remain. He says it 11 times in just a few short verses. Remain, stay connected, abide in me because everything else that comes in discipleship comes out of relationship. Connection is the priority. Connection, connection is the beginning spot. But whenever we live according to my way, whenever we're doing faith my way, what this relationship looks like is it looks like a lot of warm and fuzzies. This is what I want from Jesus. I want goosebumps. I want mountaintops. I want everything to be wonderful. I want what I want when I want it. In other words, it's more like a crush. This relationship's more like a crush. It's all about my feelings and what I can get out of it. But the Jesus way of relationship is covenant. It's deep, it's meaningful, it's difficult, it's hard. It means, it means I'm laying down my independence and I'm becoming dependent on someone else. It means it's not all about me, it's also about him. It means there's sacrifice, it means there's commitment, it means there's devotion. Okay, the me way of following Jesus is all about goosebumps and I just wanna, I just wanna have this little kumbaya relationship with Jesus. And Jesus said, no, no, the way of discipleship according to me is covenant relationship. It's deep and it's meaningful and it's difficult. This is why we, we talk so much about spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices because this is how we posture ourselves to be in relationship with him, to know him, to be in his presence, to abide in him. You know, probably the, maybe the unofficial slogan of Christianity would be this, that it's not about religion, it's about what? relationship, right? We should put it on a t-shirt or something. That's like the unofficial slogan. And it's great and all. The problem with it is that we, it, we treat it like that's it. That's it. And the stopping point. And so many people, that's it. I'm going to go sing Kumbaya with Jesus or around, a, around a bonfire. I'm going to have this, this little warm and fuzzy relationship with Jesus and that's it. But it's only the beginning of discipleship. Notice I'm only at point one and I said I got three. This is the beginning of discipleship. Everything comes out of relationship. Everything happens within the context of relationship, but relationship isn't the end game. The end game is becoming like Jesus. Relationship alone will not make you like Jesus. So that's point one. Discipleship according to Jesus is relationship. Here's point two. Discipleship according to Jesus is apprenticeship. It's apprenticeship. I know it's not a word we use a whole lot, but I think most of us understand what that word means. Back in Mark 3, this is what happens. We already read it once. Jesus went up on a mountainside, called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, again, relationship, and that he might send them out. So let me just go ahead and tell you, point three probably has something to do with being sent out because that's what we see right here. Just, you know, spoiler alert. So I'm with Jesus, I'm in relationship. Eventually, when I look like him and I'm like him, he's actually gonna send me out. So right here in the middle is this word and, and there's so much packed into that word. Because he's saying that I might send them out. One day I'm gonna send them out when they are trained and prepared to be sent out. You see, in that right there is nestled. If you could just double click, zoom in and kind of see what's in that is the three years that Jesus spent with his disciples training them to be like him. It didn't just happen. Think about the life of Peter. It didn't just happen. No, there was training. There was intentional training that happened. When they went up on that mountain, this wasn't just some sweet little community. No, this was a training community. Jesus was calling them to learn something and then do something different based on what they had learned. When he called the disciples, I mentioned this a minute ago, in Mark 1, he called them and he said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. He is going to make them to become something different. Think about what that means. Jesus is always making someone become something different. That's what Jesus is doing. 
That's what this community, this training community looks like. He's calling them into relationship so that he can train them to become like him. So this word apprentice is really the best word for understanding what a disciple is. It's more than relationship, it's apprentice. It's sitting underneath a master. Think master craftsman. Think, you know, if you're in the medical community and a residency program, a training program where you're following other doctors and you're learning from them, right? This is the idea of an apprentice. You're learning from a master craftsman or a master at something to the point that you're good enough to actually become a master in it and then you take on an apprentice, okay? That's the same picture for discipleship. So, so think about it. What's something in your life that you've been trained in? That you've gone through some sort of a training program. Maybe it's your vocation. Maybe it's in athletics. Think about running a marathon, right? You don't just hop up one day and decide I'm gonna go run a marathon. Well, you do that, you do that one time, right? No, no, there's a, there's a process to training to run a marathon. 26 miles is a long way. You don't just hop up and you don't just do that. Studying for the bar exam, preparing for the bar exam, military, right? I went to film school. Some of you guys, you may have no idea that I went to film school, but the program I went to was an apprenticeship. It wasn't just education. It was put hands on a camera and actually learn how to write, produce, and actually create film, right? It's an apprenticeship program. It's learning something new. Ultimately, it's training. It's training you to do something new. The thing is, we don't like to think of discipleship as training because training seems hard. Remember what Jesus said? The narrow way is hard. And training is hard. So we don't like to think that discipleship is hard. We think that it should be easy. Our way of doing discipleship, our way of living the faith is just trying real hard. Not trading, but trying real hard. I'm going to read the scriptures. I'm going to know the rules to follow, and I'm going to try really hard to follow those rules. I'm going to try, I'm going to try, I'm going to white knuckle it. I'm going to grit my teeth, and I'm going to try my best to do it. And when you fail, Some people, when they fail at that, they back away from the faith altogether or they get just bitter or angry or they just throw in the towel and say, I'm just not gonna try anymore. I guess that's not for me because trying doesn't get you there. It would be like you watching football every single week for your entire life. And then today you decide to put pads and a helmet on and go play in the Super Bowl and just try really hard. Would that work? Right? No, it takes years and years of training to have the skills and a little bit of natural talent, I'm sure, to actually go and play in the NFL and be in the Super Bowl, right? Like it doesn't just happen. There's training involved. And the same process of discipleship is the same in any other field. This is the same in any other thing. You have to be trained in it. Just like learning how to ride a bike, just like learning how to drive a car which is a great example, by the way, because we're literally, Beck and I are literally teaching our oldest right now how to drive. So if you think about it, you learn anything, like there's this, there, at, at the beginning of learning something, there's, a, there's an excitement about learning something new. So driving a car, there's an excitement about, man, this life that I could have Once I've got the car keys and I've got my own car and I can live my own life, I can be independent, man, this is exciting. I've been watching my parents. I've been in the backseat watching my parents drive for years and years. This looks easy. This looks simple. I'm excited about learning something new. And there's kind of this motivation, this we'll call an aha moment where you just feel like, man, I can't wait to get behind the wheel of the car or whatever it is that you're training in. You think, I can't wait to do that thing. I've got this. The problem is, is that you don't know what you don't know. And so when the reality hits you clean upside the head, how difficult that thing is, we call that the pit. All of a sudden, you, you're completely aware that I, that, I, that I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, right? A friend of mine calls this up here, this, this kind of unconscious incompetence that I don't know what I don't know. It's all enthusiasm. It's all confidence. I can't wait to get behind the wheel of the car, but you have no idea. And you're oblivious to it. You have no idea. 
And then all of a sudden you get behind the wheel of a car and you realize, oh, this thing's really big and it goes really fast and all the other cars go really fast and there's a lot of knobs and a lot of buttons and I don't really know what to do. And then all of a sudden you're very aware of what you do not know. This is the reason I don't play golf. <laughs> for, for real, I played baseball my whole life. I thought, oh, I could go play golf. John Wiggins, I could go play golf. I can go out there, I can, I, can, I can swing, I can hit a ball, that's easy. All of a sudden, two times in, I realize I stink at this and I'm done with it. It's so much harder than I thought and I throw in the towel. It's the same thing with anything. Think about driving. All of a sudden you go, oh, this is so overwhelming. There's so much to go. You could walk away from it or you could learn and you could train. And now all of a sudden there's a process of you training in how to do it. You learn the information and then you also get behind the wheel of the car. And you, you start learning, you start get, gaining a little bit of competence in doing something, all the while you're having to think about every step of the way. When you're learning how to drive a car, I mean, you're, you're sitting behind the, the, the steering wheel and you have a checklist running in your mind. Oh, I, gotta, I better check my mirrors. I got 10 and two. I got I to make sure I'm, I'm doing blinkers, I, all the buttons, all the knobs. And you're literally thinking through all the things that you've got to do. And you're training, you're developing something new to eventually you get back up here to the road where life is wonderful and life is good. And what happens is, and this is what's happened to probably most of the people in this room, when you drove here today, you didn't think about it one time. You changed lanes, you used blinkers. You, I mean, you did all the things. Why? Because you've been doing it for 30 years or 20 years. It's natural now. But there was a time in your life that it wasn't natural, that you were awkward, you were clumsy, you were stalling traffic out, you needed one of those bumper stickers that says, please be patient, I'm a student driver. Like at some point it was horrible. And then you took the time to learn and to grow in a skill and a competency to the point that now in your life, you don't even have to think about it. You're a driver. That's discipleship. And what Jesus does is he leads us. We call this the dip. If this is the disciples journey, this is the dip. And Jesus leads us through this dip over and over and over again. Constantly bringing us to an awareness that we don't know what we don't know. And then he says, let me take you by the hand. Let me bring people around you and let me train you out of this pit so that it becomes natural to you. So that living the, the character traits, the love, the compassion, the way he treats his enemies, the, all these different things, like it just becomes natural to who we are because we've trained in it. See, what we do is we want to just, we want to just kind of leapfrog. Boop. We just want to kind of jump over there. And actually, if you came out of a charismatic background, right, what you thought right here is that you can just show up and just get enough of a touch of the Holy Spirit, right? And all of a sudden, I'm just going to be there. It's like, like, like the matrix when Neo wakes up I know Kung Fu. You remember that part? Like all of a sudden they just like da -da 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 -da, download, I know Kung Fu. Like that's what we want. We, we want discipleship just to be this little bloop, but that's not what we see in the gospels. Jesus trained them. He sent them, he trained them, like he developed them into who they were gonna become. And that's what discipleship is. It's apprenticeship, it's apprenticeship to Jesus and it's over and it's over and it's over again until we become like Jesus. That's number two, here's number three and I'm so out of time, I'll be quick. Number three is this, is that discipleship according to Jesus is apostleship. Now I know that's a big word, maybe it's a little bit of a scary word, but notice it's not apostle in the capital A sense, we're not talking about the 12 apostles. The word apostle just means sent one one who is sent. And here's the thing about a disciple. Every disciple is sent. Every disciple. There is not a category of disciple that just parks in relationship and just stays there. There's not a category of disciple that just gets trained. No, a disciple is in relationship, getting training so that Jesus can send them. To do, to, to do what? To do the work that he had been doing. Again, Mark 3, 
Jesus went up on a mountainside and he called to him those he wanted and they came to him. And then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have the authority to drive out demons. Preaching the way Jesus preached with his life and his words, the authority to drive out demons does not happen on day one. Training is necessary, but eventually Jesus is going to send. Eventually, Jesus is going to sin because that's the end game. That is the whole thing. Go and make disciples. You go and apprentice someone else. You go and train someone else. Lead them to Christ and then disciple them. That is what we're called to do. See, my way, if I'm living the faith according to my way, what this looks like is, hey, all you pastors and you staff and you, you professional Christians, this is y'all's thing. We're just gonna sit back and we're just gonna kind of do our little thing and show up at church. But all that sending stuff, that preaching stuff, that authority to drive out darkness, no, 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 that's, that's all your things. That's y'all's thing. But the Jesus way is that everybody everywhere is called to be an everyday missionary in every sphere of their life. That's the Jesus way. That wherever you go, you go with the authority of Jesus Christ to drive out darkness. Everywhere you go, that's being sent. We see a beautiful picture of this in Luke 8. Jesus is alone, like he's doing all of the ministry in Luke 8. And then Luke 9 is when he sends out the 12, two by two. He sends them out to go and preach the gospel. They come back. He immediately engages with them in feeding of the 4,000. Then the very next chapter, Luke 10, Jesus sends out 72. You see what he's doing? He's sending more and more. And then by Acts 1, it's 120. And Jesus is sending them to launch the church. Every disciple of Jesus is sent. And we're gonna unpack this more and more and we got plenty of time to figure this out and to talk through this. But you have to understand that when it comes to discipleship, according to Jesus, it's relationship, but it does not end there. It's apprenticeship and then it's apostleship. It means being sent, being sent into our world with the authority of Jesus Christ to preach with our lives, to preach not, not just with words, but with our lives in every sphere, every place that we go to, to impact people around us and then to call people alongside us to train, to disciple, to, to have someone else apprentice under us. That's what the Great Commission is all about. Discipleship to Jesus is always about deeper levels of death, deeper levels of commitment, and deeper levels of apprenticeship to Jesus. That's the way of Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, it's hard. It's not for everybody. He wants it to be for everybody, but not everybody will sign up for that. We've gotten to the point that our Christian walk's pretty easy. I can just keep doing my thing, living my way with kind of this eternal security. For what Jesus is calling us to understand as a church is that that's not what he's called us to. That's not what being a disciple is. You know what that is? Selfish. Because it's your way. It's you taking the almighty sovereign God and saying, I know you did all of this, but I know better. And I'm gonna do it all my way. And Jesus didn't invite us into that. He said, your way doesn't lead to anything but destruction. It's his way that leads to life. And it's hard and it's difficult to get there. But when you get there, he said that his yoke is light. His yoke is easy. In other words, his way of life is easy. But getting there is hard. It's difficult. It's gonna take work. It's gonna take reprogramming. It's gonna take paradigm shifts. It's gonna take letting go of some old things, some old thoughts, some old priorities, some old, like it's gonna, it's gonna require sacrifice and commitment. It's gonna require devotion and passion 
and commitment to the way of Jesus. And I just, I feel like today, when I prayed about how to close, I just felt like God was bringing me back to that question that we'll ask sometimes. Just, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Some of you guys, this may be your very first time and wow, what a great week to walk in on. But those of you that are here and you're leaned in and you just, you know God's got you here and you're, you're excited and you're passionate and you, you know God's doing something. This is the moment to lean in and just say, Holy Spirit, what does this mean to me? Like, what are you saying to me in this season? What is this, my discipleship to Jesus, my following the way, like, what does this mean to me? What, what, what do I need to let go of? What, 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 what am I holding on to that I'm trying to, to make Jesus' way my way and I'm trying to try to muddle all these things together? Je- Holy Spirit, reveal to me what it is so that I can, and give me the strength then to cut that thing off, to let that thing go, to move away from that priority, to move away from whatever it is that doesn't line up with the Jesus way. Help me, train me, get me through this so that I can become the disciple that I'm called to be. Just bow your head for a second and just in your own words, just ask the Holy Spirit that. Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me today? And then the second question is, Holy Spirit, what's my response to that? Holy Spirit, how am I supposed to respond? What do I need to do? What's my next step, Lord? What is the thing that I need to let go of? What is the thing that the shift that needs to happen in my mind, my paradigm? Holy Spirit, speak to me and show me what is next. And what I know and what I believe is that he will. And if he doesn't today, then tomorrow or the next day, you just... You in silence and solitude and spending time with God and listening prayer, you just spend time with him and you open your heart up and you allow him to speak and you allow him to shift and form and shape and mold. And it's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. But it's to get us to life. The way to life, eternal and abundant. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are here, that you are with us, that you are speaking to us. Your presence is so sweet, so thick, it's so real. And I'm grateful that you are here, that you're moving in our midst, that you're speaking to us. Lord, I pray that this wouldn't just, that this wouldn't just be another Sunday, but that God, something special happened today, something real, something deep, something meaningful. A paradigm was shifted, a mindset was unlocked. And God, you began something today. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're leaving this experience excited, inspired by what God is doing in your life. And look, maybe you're ready to take a step. It could look like a decision to follow Jesus or getting prayer for something that's going on in your life, or maybe it's just getting connected to our church and growing in community with other believers. We wanna give you the opportunity to take that step right now. So look, there's a QR code coming up on your screen. Follow that link and let us connect with you. Because here's what we know, watching or, or consuming content by itself is never going to do it when it comes to finding the life that God has for you. So we'd love to connect with you, get to know you a little bit more, but ultimately, let's grow together. Let's be a part of the church. And we can't wait to see you next time right here at City Hope Church.